Sing me a song, the last that is gone. Say, could that last be I? Hello, and welcome to the second episode in our Outlander End of Summer series. If you haven't seen last week's conversation with our favorite author, be sure to watch and learn some compelling insights from Diana Gabaldon. And please consider clicking the link on this page to support Doctors Without Borders as they continue to do important work around the world responding to COVID-19. This week, Teresa Carl Sanders, the author and culinary artist behind the best-selling book series, Outlander Kitchen, is joined by actors Lauren Lyle and John Bell for a lesson in cooking that would make any foodie proud. And we're gonna end this episode with an exclusive peek at an Outlander Untold scene, available on the season five Blu-ray, DVD, and digital releases. So make sure to stick around and check it out. Without further ado, let's dive in. Hi, Teresa. Thank you, Meryl, for that introduction and welcome everybody. We're gonna do a recipe today from the new Outlander Kitchen to the new world and back again. And I'm very excited to join John Bell, who plays young Ian. Hi, Teresa. And I hear we also have another person joining us live from the UK. Hello. 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 Yes, <laughs> the United Kingdom. But lovely to be joining you. I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited to cook. I'm coming from, from Madrid in Spain. This is my new flat here. I can't wait to see what you're going to make for us. You've got some, they look like spring onions, but I believe, do the Americans say scallions? I say green onions, but the style guide for the cookbook says scallions. So we shall say scallions today. Perfect. Excellent. Sounds Perfect. great. So we're going to make fried fish and batter. And this is inspired by An Echo in the Bone by Diana. And it's a scene where young Ian's been gone for a long time and he's just come back to reunite with everybody. And it interrupts Ian's trip to get the fish fried and batter. I can imagine it was a, a, a very lovely moment for him. And also fish and chips. I don't know about you, Lauren, but that is such a, or fish in general, fried fish is such a Scottish thing. We grew up yeah, on chippy. Get your chippy. chippy. Get your chippy. chippy. We were having so a this debate. Is fantastic. Ah, uh -huh. loads of me and my friends are having a debate about this the other week about people I'd grown up with. We were like, what was the best chippy? We all definitely agreed it was like the worst, most fried, battered one with like the oddest, crispiest chips. You don't want fancy. Well, I say this, you don't want fancy fish and chips. However, I feel like, Teresa, you're about to give us fancy yeah. fish and chips. My fish and chips, the batter's a little different. It's gluten-free, actually, this one. So it works for a lot of people. If you're not gluten-free, you can just substitute regular flour for it. But when I go through the recipe, you'll see what I mean. It's got a few different ingredients. It's got some vodka in the batter, as well as some beer. Oh, party. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very early. It's early in the morning here yet, but uh, it's never too early to break open the bar when you're, when you're cooking. Correct. Oh, it's five o'clock somewhere, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we're going to do is make a tartar sauce, a really quick one. It's quite, it's pretty simple. I've got a cup of mayonnaise here. You could make it at home, but I've just used a bottled kind from the store. And I've got a couple of green onions that I'm going to chop up and mince up nice and small so that it's not too chunky. So what kind of knives are you using? Genuinely, because I've got rubbish knives and I need to try and update them. The, the, the worst thing you can have in a kitchen is a dull knife or a crappy knife. I've mm -hmm. got one actually not that expensive. It cost me about $60. It's easy to keep sharpened. I hold it on the hasp where the blade meets the handle and I grip over there and you never, ever, ever see what, where my finger is. You never put your finger there. That's what a lot of people do. And that doesn't give you very much control. You want to have it like this. Lord, did you know that? Cause I had no idea. I, I've always Yes, been... John, actually. Thank you. Thank you for asking, John. I did know that. Thank you for asking me. That's, that was really good of you. I did know that, and I know a lot about what's already been said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I must have not been paying attention in my home economics class. I didn't even do home ec. My mum just, my gran was an amazing cook, and it was an incredible baker, and my mum learnt from her, and then I learnt from the two of them. As I grew up, I just would pick stuff up and um, I love it as well. I, I love cooking for my friends and the love of it. Absolutely. There's a certain, I don't know, it's like a different kind of feeling you get when you put it on the table and everyone comes in and enjoys it and then says that was so good. The, the Germans probably have a word for it. A provider, uh, it, it just fills me with so much happiness. So it's certainly yeah. something I want to improve. Yeah, that's the thing that I have missed a little bit in lockdown is not being able to have dinner parties and have friends over and have your bottle of wine with a meal and candles and 
everyone just like mm. the arguments that occur after a dinner party as well there's something really warm and comforting yeah and i think that's that's actually really funny because that's what attracted me to outlander and generated the whole idea for a cookbook was because diana has so many scenes around the table that makes me think of the scene where young ian's come back we were all filming and Marceline Fergus had to grill young Ian about what his life had been like with the Mohawk. And it's all around the dinner table. What a tale you must have to tell. Start at the beginning and don't leave anything out. You already came the beginning. And we're eating the ending for supper. Well, and it was like one of those typical things where you're forced to sit and really talk to each other and meaningfully have a conversation. And do you not remember that day, the food that they made? I mean, the Outlander chefs, we have proper old school cheese, like wheels of cheese and real meat that's beautifully cooked. And we had a proper, proper meal that day. And everyone, like they had roast beef all sliced up really beautifully. And all of us were like, guys, this is better than lunch. This is better than catering. Yeah. We're not, we'll all just eat this. Don't worry about it. It was great. <laughs> Yeah, I can remember that, Lauren. It was a it was a strange one because, of course, it was the return of young Ian, um, and we're here we are as a family trying to enjoy ourselves, and he's so lost in his own world that even the food that we are presenting to each other isn't even able to break down the barriers. So it was almost this like moment when the cameras would uh, would cut and we'd go back to ourselves and just chatting about the food and having a good time. Yeah. It was this weird, yeah, this weird comparison. It was great. Teresa, what have you um, what have you put into your, have we missed some ingredients there that you've popped into your tartar sauce? We've got some mayonnaise and some chopped scallions and some chopped gherkins so far. I've got some capers, some fresh dill that I just picked from the garden that I'm going to put in there as well. Show you up here. There it is, the dill. Ooh, lush. And if you don't like dill, you can use parsley. And if you don't have anything green, you can just leave it out. See, when Marsley was announced uh, to be part of the show, I think it was Diana and our vocal coach wanted to tell the fans that the way you pronounce Marsley is like parsley. So everyone, since season three, has gone around saying, oh, Marsley, like parsley. And the irony of it all is that I, that's the one food in the whole world that I despise. <laughs> I'm guilty Absolutely. of it too, Lauren. It's the strongest flavor that I'd much rather have. Like, I love coriander, I love chives. Parsley, it's like a, I don't know if, if anyone else feels that with herbs, but it's just not the one. I've met a few passionate, passionate fans along the way um, that really hate thyme. And, and I use a lot of thyme. I like thyme. I don't know, never heard of anyone who hates thyme until Outlander Kitchen. <laughs> yes, you can always leave out any herb. If you don't like it, just leave it out. So I'm just mixing up all of this. This is the tartar sauce. It's complete. It's got some mayonnaise in it, some scallions or chopped green onions, some gherkins, some capers, some dill, and some Dijon mustard, and some, I'm gonna mess it up, Worcestershire sauce. Is it Worcester sauce? Worcester sauce. Or Worcestershire sauce. So I'm between two or three syllables. Worcestershire. I think it's three syllables. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. It's, I don't know if that's right. I dated a guy from Worcester once, and that I don't even, I haven't got, I've got, i from that area, and I still don't have it. <laughs> so we've got the tartar sauce already, and now we're just gonna batter the fish and fry it. I've turned my oil on. So here we are with the fish and chip batter. I like it a lot, it's really crispy, it's flaky, it gives you that nice crunch. It's a pretty solid batter, so like you say, the, the most fried, the most battered fish is always the best. <laughs> We're so dirty up in Scotland, I love it. <laughs> so, I've got some brown rice flour here. If you're not gluten-free, again, use regular flour. The directions are given in the cookbook, Outlander Kitchen, so that you can use what you have in your pantry. That's one of my guiding principles, is use what you've got in your pantry. We can always make substitutions, it doesn't really matter. So that's the brown rice flour. And then here's some cornstarch that's going in. And the cornstarch is what helps make that batter really, really crispy. Mm. And then this is some salt and some cayenne and a little bit of sugar. And the sugar is in there to make everything brown a little bit more nicely. So were you using any form of breadcrumb or anything like that? Is it more of a powdered, I guess, batter? It's more like a pancake batter. Ah, so we do stuff like, and I know like beer battered, fish and you would do that sort of thing where you're it's like a pancake batter but you're adding beer exactly and here it is i've got beer 
Mm. So I've got my fish here. It's cod. You could use haddock or you could use halibut if you've got it. I'm just dredging it in the flour and that mixture that I made before I um, add the vodka to the batter. So I've got two of them dredged there. Mm. What does the vodka actually do? The vodka reduces the amount of water in the batter and it evaporates really quickly. Alcohol evaporates really quickly. So you get a crisper batter and then the beer gives it a little bit of flavor. So what is your favorite beer? There's some really good craft beer places in London where I live, some really amazing breweries and love a pale ale and things like that. Probably the paler, the better. Um, no, do you know what I'm lying to you? I love Guinness. I know it's not a beer, but I love Guinness, yeah. Yeah, well, you could use Guinness in this batter really quite, it would be really nice. It would give it a nice dark color and it would give it lots of flavor. The only thing I don't recommend using is like an IPA. Anything with a lot of hops in it, or so a lager, hops go bitter when you cook them. Mm. So you always want to cook with an ale or a stout. Are you a beer man, John? Um, I, I do occasionally like to indulge in a little bit of tenants, seeing as I'm a Scot, of course. Um, and yes, I do. I do like a, I do like a beer. Um, I would say I'm no expert. I'd say my dad's more an expert. He actually makes his own beer. So he brews it, brews it himself at home. So it'd be kind of interesting to make this recipe and actually use one of his home brews. And then it's his home brewed beer, fish and chip style. I love that. So I, might, I think I'm gonna suggest that to him. Yeah. Okay, so here's our dry batter. And like I said, I have dusted the fish lightly with that. And now I'm gonna add a half a cup of beer and a half a cup of vodka. So this is a quick thing. You don't have to make it. A couple of lumps in the batter are fine. If you over mix it, that's when the batter starts, the, the coating starts to get tough. So the less you mix it, the better. The other thing we have to do is while we're doing the batter is heat up the oil. So we're gonna heat up the oil to about 350 degrees. I've got a instant read thermometer. If you don't have an instant read thermometer, if you've got a cube of white bread, you can throw it in there. And as soon as it goes brown, the oil's ready. See, when you're mixing the batter, is there a trick to not knocking all the air out of the bubbles from the beer as well? Or is that not relevant here? It is really relevant. And, and that's actually a really good question. The best way to keep the bubbles in the beer are to open it just before you pour it in. And that giving it lightness to the batter. And that gives it lightness and the bubbles. And there's a, there's a little bit of yeast in there too. So that's what gives it a bit of um, lightness as well. So this is the Outlander Kitchen. This is your second Outlander Kitchen book. Am I right? My second Outlander Kitchen book, yes. So this one is titled Outlander Kitchen to the New World and Back Again. There's 100 recipes in the book and about 90 of them are brand spanking new. Nobody's ever seen them before. So I'm really hoping it will help get people through Droughtlander because it's a big deal for, for some of us fans. It's a big long break. I, I hope everybody likes it. I'm really proud of it. This is a big question. This is probably the biggest question you'll ever have been asked in your life. <laughs> what is, from one chef, Marsley Fraser to the other. What is your favorite recipe from this cookbook? Lord John's Yorkshire puddings. Very nice, very. I think it's a good Yorkshire pudding recipe, but I also have a lot of fun um, having it tested. So I have fans that do all the testing for the recipes in the books. There's 10 of them, they work really hard. They, they cook about 18 recipes each before I send the cookbook into the publisher. And the one that was really popular and not very well known, I was really surprised that a lot of people in the Southern states had never had a Yorkshire pudding before. We, me and my friends on Sundays, it's tradition you'll go to the pub and have a Sunday roast. You have to. It's really weird if you don't do that. And you always, and that's the good measure of a good Sunday roast is it's Yorkshire pudding. Anyone from Yorkshire would tell you so. What's your favorite thing to cook? My favorite food in the whole world would definitely be pasta. If I had my sort of, um, death row meal it would be past just past the cheese and sweet corn which is really weird <laughs> that isn't what i would cook for friends if they were coming over okay so my oil's ready so it's probably a good time to do it because oil is a finicky thing so we're ready to fry we've got this lovely batter that i will show you here and we've got a piece of fish and we're just going to dredge it the batter's a bit thick because we've been talking. So it's nicely dredged and then I'm just gonna hold it above the bowl and let it drip off and into the oil it goes. And then I've got another piece here and I'll do the same thing. And I sort of, when I drop it, I just kind of let it drop into the oil really gently so you don't get a big spurt. 
Um, and they won't stick together that way if you do it like that either. So you just have to add a little a little finesse when you put it in. Just a wee oh yes, and then when I salt it at the end, you'll see my big. <laughs> <laughs> Young Ian's actually quite a good cook. I don't know if you know that from the books, but he's uh, he's been taught uh, quite a few dishes um, that he presents to the Fraser clan at different times after he gets back from being with the Mohawk. So from what I understand, Teresa, from a little bit of research I've done into what dishes were prepared by the Native Americans on the eastern part of the, of the US, there was something called the Three Sisters, am I right? Which was corn, squash, and uh, I can't remember the third one. Beans. Beans, Beans. yes, and they were all <laughs> grown together, right? Yeah, on a big mound. Um, and because the three plants companion plant really well together. So they fight off diseases that one plant is vulnerable to, another one of those plants will keep the, pug, the bugs away. Um, and that's exactly what young Ian cooks in the books. He cooks lots of uh, wild yams as well. He's very good with a wild yam, Claire says. Oh, I must say I'm pretty good with a wild yam myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave you to alone. <laughs> So the fish is fried. There we go. I'll put it. Oh, yes. Speaking of the first Outlander kitchen, I've got some French fries here that are really easy. You start them in cold oil. You start. You cover them with cold vegetable oil. You turn the pan on high until and when they're golden brown, they're done. It's the easiest way to make french fries in the whole world. And see when you're chopping your french fries, do you ever, with the potatoes, once you've chopped them, do you put the potatoes in water to draw out the starch before you fry them? Or do you just not bother? It depends on the type of potato you use. If you use a baker potato, like, you know, like a baking potato with a rough skin, um, you'll want to soak that. Okay. If you use a Yukon Gold or one with a golden skin, like a white potato, you don't need to soak it. So that's what I've used here. I've used red potatoes. So they're the same. So we had it in the oil, um, the fish in the oil for about five to six minutes for a piece this size. The thicker the fish, the longer it's gonna take to cook. So, and if you're unsure, you can always just pull the fish out, very gently pull apart the batter and go in and see if the fish flesh is cooked inside. And if it's not, just put it back in the oil um, for another minute or two and it'll turn out great. So Teresa, how long does this recipe take to make? How long do you reckon you would need for your prep as well as your cooking before you serve it. Um, would you want to serve it straight away or is it something you'd hold off on? Okay, that's a good question. It's a really quick recipe. To make the tartar sauce and do the fish and fry it, it would probably take about a half an hour, not much longer than that. Depending on your cooking skill, it's a pretty easy recipe to do. And then you definitely want to serve it right away. So batter is not something that sits very well. It gets a bit soggy. You want, it serve, you want to have everybody at the table and serve it as soon as that fish is out of the oil. Nice, cool, thank you. What do you think, John? You are making me very jealous right now, honestly. Really unfair, and it's actually, you know, it's 8 p.m. here and they don't eat dinner for another hour and a half. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do, <laughs> but I can tell you that I must go out and get myself a nice bit of white fish and try this myself, because, Teresa, it looks beautiful. Delicious, thank you so much for sharing. Oh, well, thank you. What do you think, Lauren? Yeah, it looks delicious, amazing. And all good tips as well. And I'm, I'm not very much of an expert cook. I'm, I'm looking at two expert cooks right here, but what would you say was the difficulty level here? Do you think this is something that anybody can cook or that is maybe requires a bit more practice? No, I think it's actually pretty accessible for everybody. The scariest thing is the hot oil. And as long as you don't overfill the pot, give yourself lots of room for that oil to bubble up, you'll be fine. And once you've done it once, the fear goes away and then you can do it again and it just gets better and better. Do you think, Teresa, this is the sort of thing the Frasers would eat on the ridge of a Friday night after a long day's battle. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might go over better than Claire's peanut butter sandwiches did. Everybody looks like that was a very 18th century moment there with y'all chewing on those sandwiches and wondering what the heck this peanut butter was. I think that Jamie would enjoy a piece of fried fish. I don't know anyone that doesn't except people that don't eat fish. Jamie would be out catching it in the river. Totally. Claire, Claire with her gun shooting it or something in the water. I, I, actually, I was also um, quite the adept fish gutter in one of this episode this season, so I think young Ian would really? get his uh, Yeah, 
So the scene where I um, I sort of reveal a little bit about where young Ian's been. I'm gutting fish, and I had to learn how to gut fish for it too. And catching it in the in the river, with the water up to my thighs. Oh, it was a it was a very sexy moment for young Ian. Yeah, we've both been in some real sexy like cutting up moments this year, haven't we? Absolutely. Like blood up to here, and you've got water up to here. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? Cooking sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute thrill to learn from you, Teresa. That's been amazing. It has been an absolute pleasure learning from you, Teresa, and reminiscing with you, Lauren. Hope you guys can get together and cook along with each other um, and cope through Droughtlander. We'll see you soon. Lots of love. Lots of love. Outlander Kitchen to the New World and Back Again is on sale now. Thank you so much for joining us and happy Droughtlander, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Teresa, Lauren, and John for teaching us some new cooking skills and thanks to the fans for tuning in. If you've enjoyed what you've seen today, please feel free to click the link on this page to help us support Doctors Without Borders. Once again, we now have an exclusive sneak peek at an Outlander Untold scene from the season five DVD and Blu-ray release. Please enjoy and tune in next time for more of our end of summer series. Today we're filming the DVD extra scene, War Paint. What this scene is about is young Ian preparing to go to war, really for the first time. Ian is looking for ingredients in order to make a blood red paint, which is really his sort of form of armor. Ian's asking Lizzie to help him to get ready for battle. He's trying to embody the Mohawk that he has lived with over the last few years. She's terrified that by doing something for Ian, such as that, she would let him down again. She certainly, I think, puts it into perspective what he's doing and challenges him. That almost gives him even more confidence. They actually kind of bolster each other to do the thing they need to do. I'm going with Uncle Jamie. I'm going to war. The paint is for my face. Please, you, you didn't have to go with them, with the other men. Please, don't leave us, you might get hurt. Well, this house is so big and now you're here. You've come back. How empty it'll be without you. We'll be alone here. I must go, Lizzie.